Hello clever people and welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. I'm afraid I'm very very late but this is the community Q&A that I have promised. This Q&A covers the question that came in from the few day, last few days of 2019 to the end of February 2020. I'm afraid people who actually ask a, a question on the form, link in the comments below, um, in March, we'll have to wait for the next Q&A. Now, with no further ado, let's start with the first question. So what gives the S400 its range and which are the design configuration? Well, you start from the energy. We said in a previous video that the energy is what allows a missile to go somewhere and do something. Uh, so if you want to have a missile that has a 400 kilometers range and when it gets to 400 kilometers still has enough energy to do some maneuvering to try to hit a target, uh, yes, you need to get prepared and design a missile um, in order to give the terminal part of the missile that is going to hit the target enough energy to do so. Uh, if you notice, the missiles are, uh, in use in, um, by the S-400 are relatively large, actually quite large and bulky missiles. They have two stages, which by the missile equation gives uh, some advantages when it comes to the long range and in fact has different types of missiles with different ranges. In terms of consideration, what do you have to maximize is probably the specific impulse of each stage, which is a measure of the efficiency of the missile. And uh, well, there's not much more than that, to be honest, there's no silver bullet, is just the energy that you can import to the missile which is by far the most important parameter that you have to consider when trying to understand, trying to evaluate, trying to assess the capability of a weapon. Well, that's not really a question. I'm just saying thank you, thank you very much. You have no idea how much I appreciate uh, this kind of acknowledgement of the work that I do. It is something where I put a lot of effort, a lot uh, of um, commitment. And uh, yeah, it is something that I love doing and it is incredible, it is beautiful to understand that there are some other people actually share my point of view about what I do. Just say, if you want to help me, something which is very, very useful for the channel is please share the videos on your social media or to everybody who could be interested. This is very important for the channel growth. And if the channel grows, the quality of the stuff that I can produce and the time that I can give to the channel will grow as well and so the quality will go up and everybody will be happy. So coming to the second part of your question about the forward swept wing and why it was never developed to become a, an operational plane. Um, well, there are some excellent videos on YouTube that explain this in great detail but to be uh, just to, to give you an idea there are two main reasons because uh, this configuration is not practical for an operational plane the first is the aeroelasticity in the sense that the way the wing bends if it is forward swept is such that can cause stall of the tip of the wing and um, yeah, you may imagine it's not the most efficient thing to do. Also, vibrations are more difficult to control and to predict. So it's structurally complicated. It's structurally not a sound solution. The other problem is that the 
stability of playing the forward right wing is um, well difficult to ensure and uh, actually they tend to be uh, very unstable and a bit too much unstable to be used I mean neutral stability or some instability is good for a fighter too much instability is definitely impractical well thank you for asking the question but i have no idea if i had to make an educated guess i believe that considering that there are very uh, sensitive uh, electronic support measures in use in the world they could probably track the emissions of a cell phone but i don't even know exactly if they're listening in those areas of sequence of frequencies uh, i don't know exactly how a cell phone is actually emitting even if it's not connected with the towers um, so honestly i don't know probably yes maybe yes but don't quote me on that Uh, the Tejas, uh, I mean, probably 10% of the comments that I receive are please cover the Tejas. And by the way, if there are some Indian viewers that would like to point me to the correct pronunciation of this plane, that would be actually useful. So I can only answer as I have already answered in a post, in a community post some time ago. Please be patient. The Tejas is on the is in the pipeline. I'm going to make a video because there are some interesting elements uh, to be discussed about the Tejas. Just be patient, please. <laughs> First part of the question: How to um, beat the AS400. Well, probably a good way could be actually roll over the battery with a company of tanks or maybe trying to saturate the defense with enough targets uh, to force the, um, the battery or the, 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 the surface to air unit to use all their weapons. But that is obvious. Uh, this is true for pretty much anything the mm, we don't know uh, we don't know exactly how the AS400 is going to behave in a near peer uh, situation um, it has never been uh, really challenged so mm, yes there is no specific uh, uh, there's no specific answer to to, to to your question at least so far uh, we'll see well, let's hope we won't see <laughs> coming to the second part of the question what makes naisa radar lpi so low probability of intercept well first what is naisa radar for those who don't know uh, normal radars have one beam and the direction of the beam is moved um, or better direction of the beam is actually determined by the direction where the antenna is pointing you need to mechanically move the antenna to point the beam so you may imagine that if uh, you have a radar receiver and you watch um, conventional radar you can see the beam moving back and forth and if you have more than one receiver you can track exactly what the position of the beam is and the kind of patterns that the radar is using to do the search and so on Naisa radar is different Naisa radar has an antenna which is composed by a small uh, emitting modules and the direction of the beam uh, depends from the phase that is used in emitting the um, energy uh, by the single modules uh, so the antenna is fixed and the beam is steered uh, actually controlling the emissions of the single modules actually 
this is uh, all well and good, but uh, the actually scientists immediately recognize the possibility of, for example, having more than one beam from one radar. Or um, since you don't have to wait for the mechanical movement, but you can just turn on and off in milliseconds um, uh, the elements, uh, you don't need to do a pattern scan. Uh, you can flash all around and uh, yeah, keep track of the results with a computer. Obviously, this requires a lot of computing power and tends to be very sophisticated from this point of view, but you don't have an emission which is so typically the emission of a radar. Now, if the, your modules are well built, so you don't need a lot of power to identify a target, and you can keep the power of the mission low, so it doesn't not stand out too much. Um, yeah, in this case, it may be difficult for the uh, radar receivers, the enemies the radar receiver or electronic support measure to actually identify those strange emissions as a radar. Obviously, uh, to every action there is a reaction, so more modern systems start becoming capable of identifying even this strange pattern and sort of suspecting that it may come from an ESA radar. Nothing is forever, but um, uh, this is the idea. So uh, an ESA radar can be a low probability of intercept at PI because uh, can use these kind of strange patterns to emit the, emit the beams and uh, say cover the airspace. No, I didn't get a new microphone. It was just a different setup. Uh, I believe that this question refers to the recent to a recent video in which I didn't appear in person, but there was just my voice. So what I do when I don't appear in person is actually something like this. And the quality of the recording is improved because the echo from the room where I am, yes, is sort of muffled. Double delta wing. Uh, like the vegan or again the Tejas. Um, it's nothing really special. Double delta like that in which you have a portion that has um, that is swept uh, less than the rest of the wing is there's nothing really special to be honest in the sense that maybe like that just to control the position of the aerodynamic center and its relationship with the um, center of gravity of the plane or maybe like that because you want to control the formation of the vortices uh, when the angle of attack starts increasing mm, it's just a device to let's say control the, the aerodynamic flow around the around the wing there's an is nothing special it's nothing strange uh, it is just a small adjustment but it works pretty much as a normal delta how was my passion born um okay I have a master in aerospace engineering. I've always been passionate. I have worked um, for a short period of time, at the beginning of my career in the aerospace and in the defense industry. I served in the Italian Air Force. Um, I've always been passionate since uh, when I was a child, but my terrible sight actually uh, precluded me the possibility of becoming a pilot. Uh, in um, there is a video in which at the beginning I actually tell a story, a story of an episode that happened to me when I was a child and it is true, it happened for real and actually explains uh, 
part of my my interest and part of the reason why I am doing this. So yeah, go and watch the video. I left this question for last because it is a very interesting question that may be worth a video on its own. Why it is not possible to partially rebuild a fourth gen aircraft or 4.5 gen aircraft to become stealth, uh, change, basically changing the shape? Well, the aerodynamic project of a fighter is slightly, well, is a lot different than the project of a civilian airplane. A fighter is much more complicated because the shape is much more complicated. A civilian plane is optimized for basically one uh, flight condition, which is the cruise. Uh, a fighter mm, must be able to cope with quite a lot of different conditions. All of this means that the aerodynamic project is peculiar, unique, and any change of surfaces, any change of geometry may not, doesn't necessarily do, but may well compromise the whole of the performances. It's not that it's not possible, it may actually have unintended consequences that make everything else worthless. In practice, in some cases, you may end up pretty much redesigning the plane from the beginning. And at that point, it's probably not worth it. And it is even worse if you're trying to do this uh, with the outlook of actually um, updating existing airframes. Because in this case, the job becomes really, really complicated because you have, um, well, maybe older frames that will need to be uh, adapted to newer components. So you have a new plane with new components, new structural components that end up um, being coupled with old components that maybe already have some fatigue problems and uh, yeah it's terribly impractical and uh, i mean and the amount of work required to rebuild the plane like that in that way changing a substantial amount of the structural components mind mind in modern fighters the 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 the, the, the skin is part of the structure they don't have a, an internal frame or they don't just have an internal frame that is just covered by the skin. The skin is integral to the um, integrity of the structure. The, 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 the skin bears aerodynamic loads, uh, ensures rigidity and does this kind of things. No? So it's n you're not just changing a skin over a structure, you're changing the structures and uh, yeah, if you have to dismantle the structure and then rebuild the plane, it's almost like building a new plane. So normally it's not worth it, basically. That's the reason why you don't see radical intervention on the structures of modern planes. There's some stuff that can be done, it's been done many times, but yeah, it needs to be done with a grain of salt. So, thank you very much for watching. There were very interesting questions. I hope you have enjoyed this very short Q&A. Sorry for the people who uh, don't feel that I didn't reply correctly or they are not happy with their answer. That's the best I can do. In uh, the meanwhile, uh, please, uh, as usual, like, dislike, subscribe, and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar and Patreon, that would be amazing. You have no idea how much I appreciate that. So, 
Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.